Hi, I'm Daryl, and this is another Board Gem video. Uh, if you're new to the series, it's a weekly series I do in which I highlight some older board game that I consider an older gem. Maybe it's an older game, maybe it's a game that doesn't have super high ratings um, in the community on the website Board Game Geek, um, but they're games that I personally want to highlight because games don't stop being good just because newer games come out. A lot of people in the hobby are what we call cult of the new, right? They always want to try the new thing, the new games, and there's so many games that come out. I just want to highlight older games that I think are pretty cool. Now, having said that, of course, by doing so, I'm highlighting a lot of my favorite games, but that's not just what Board Gems is going to be highlighting. It's really any older game that I think is, is just something that's cool and something I want to highlight. Uh, this one I'm doing this week is not... I wouldn't call it one of my top, top favorite games, but it's one that I always enjoy playing. I think it's really neat. And it's called Fresh Fish. It was designed by Freedom and Frieza and was published by his company, Zvi F or 2F Games. Uh, I want to say in the late 90s. It was a small print run, limited print run, couple hundred copies maybe, um, maybe even handmade. I'm not, I'm not sure about that. I actually haven't seen the original, original edition uh, myself. Um, for a long time, the only edition that you could find was from a company called Planary Games. And um, as far as I know, Fresh Fish is the only game they ever published. Uh, and it shows. Production quality is fine. Artwork leaves a little something to be desired. I'm not sure if they just took the artwork from the original or not, or if they commissioned their own artist. But um, <laughs> it's not much to look at, I'm afraid. But it plays fine. It basically has the same rules as the original. A couple of tweaks, which are fine. Um, and for the longest time, that was the only edition you could find. Um, but just a, several years ago, maybe four, five, six years ago, uh, the designer and his company published a new kind of what I would call a definitive edition of Fresh Fish. And that's this, this one here. So this is Fresh Fish. And this is sort of I can tell when I when I looked at it, when I read the rules and, and opened it up, that this is intended to be the edition. Um, if you're looking, if you watch this video and you're interested at all, this is the one to get. Um, having said that, I'm going to have some thoughts at the end, why I think it's a board gem, but also why some people may not agree, why it's not for everyone. It really isn't for everyone. Um, now, this edition actually has the original rules, more or less, which they call the classic edition, um, or the classic version of the rules. And the main rules are actually a little different now. I'm not going to do those new standard rules. I'm going to go over the classic rules because that's the fresh fish I know. And that would be the board gem because that's the older rule set. Um, and it's neater, in my opinion. Um, you'll see what I mean. And I'll talk about it at the end. Um, the really organic nature of the board and how it plays out. It's really neat to see. Um, so I'm going to teach this edition, but with the classic rules. That's classic fresh fish to me. So we'll go over those rules and then afterwards I'll go over why it is, but also might not for everyone be a board gem. Set up the game, we're gonna first set up the board. Now the board is gonna be a couple of these boards there's either a little bit of a variety of boards. They're double-sided. This side is for the standard edition, which I'm not going to teach you. The plain back is for the classic edition. That's the one we're going to do today. We're going to use a number of boards equal to the number of players plus one. I'm going to set it up for a three-player game. So I'm just going to use four boards. Use just whatever boards you want. It can be random or not. It doesn't matter. So I'm using four boards for a three-player game. And just put them together any way you like. Um, you can make whatever shape you want. I'd probably suggest that for a first game, just try to keep it relatively square or circular. Maybe something like that, let's say. How does that look? And now to this, we are going to add the parking spaces for the delivery trucks. By the way, I have a cat here. The cat might make some noise. So, like it's doing now. Oh, okay. So um, we've got these uh, parking spaces and you want to spread them out around the board. You can technically put them anywhere. Um, for thematic purposes and rule books suggest this anyway, they suggest putting it around the edge. You can put it in the corner, that's fine. Just spread them out. So you can put one in the corner is fine. I'm going to avoid putting it one away from the corner. 
Um, that would trigger a rule, and I haven't explained that rule yet. So just to keep things simple, um, I'm just gonna spread these out and not have them uh, so close to the corner there. So maybe, maybe something like uh, this is fine. So you wanna spread them out. And then you're gonna prepare the draw pile. Now the draw pile is gonna consist of two types of tiles. These tiles are going to be the places where we put wooden tables. There you go, isn't that cute? It's got a little brown square inside. This is the back, by the way, and this is the front. So we're gonna have a number of these. Now, to prepare the draw pile, first we have to total up the number on all the stones. In the corner of the board, there's a number in each stone. So we're gonna add them up. So that's three and four is seven and three is 10. Let's be under here, yeah, two. So that's 12. Now the classic rules say you're gonna use that number of these. Although, unless I did my math wrong, I found that there aren't enough of these tiles, depending on the configuration, depending on the boards you use. So if you don't have enough, uh, I would use the rule in the standard edition, which is this number minus two. Uh, but let's do 12. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12. Now to that, we're going to add these stall tiles. Now, this is a complete set. You'll see there's four different stall tiles. And each player at the end of the game is going to have one stall of each type on the board. So you're gonna have one set per player. So this is one complete set. We'll have another complete set here, another one here. Now, one of these, you're just gonna set aside for now. The others, you're going to mix in with the draw pile. And I'm not gonna be shuffling this very well live. We're just gonna pretend that I shuffled it extremely well. Here, I'm shuffling it. Look, see, oh, it's all over the place. Oh, what a disaster. Anyway, you're gonna shuffle this up. Shuffle it better than I did. Now these ones, you're also going to shuffle up and you're gonna lay them out in a row. I actually don't know where the boundary is for this video. I'm just gonna put it here and hope this shows up. The order matters. So just make sure at the end of the, that this will come into play at the end of the game. Just make sure, and you'll understand what I'm talking about later, that we're gonna start here and go here. So we're gonna go through this entire draw pile, and then we're going to place these ones, this being the last one. Now each player gets some money, one five and 10 ones. I'm not gonna count that, that's close. They're also going to get four stalls. So as you can see, these stalls are the same as the parking spaces. In fact, I can go ahead and put the delivery trucks on there now. Actually, these trucks aren't necessary, but they're quite cute. Another thing you're going to, each player is going to start with, are six of these reservation markers. And you'll see each of these spaces has a little circle big enough to put a reservation marker. These markers are going to be used to reserve plots of land. Plots of land that you hope you're going to be able to put a stall in later. The goal of the game is to get your stalls as close as possible to the matching delivery uh, trucks. Because your goal is to have the freshest fish, the freshest cheese, the freshest ice cream. The ice cream hasn't melted, the soda's not flat. So you want to have this as close as possible to the delivery truck matching it. So this is the cheese stall, this is the cheese delivery truck. The closest you can be, but not as the crow flies. You always have to be traveling these paths. So this, for example, this stall is one away from the delivery truck because there's one path tile. And if it was like this, and it looks something like this, that would be three. If the stall is next to the delivery truck, that is not a distance of zero, because you always have to take a path. So at best, this is going to be a path of size two. Bloop, like that. At the end of the game, you're gonna sum up the distances of all your stalls from their respective trucks. And from that, you're going to subtract 
the amount of money you have left over. You're going to be using this money to bid on particular stall types as they come up during the game. So you'll want to get these stalls as close as possible to the delivery trucks, but not expensively if you can help it. All right, I had to do an edit because one of our cats was being noisy, keeping me company, but in a noisy way. So as you can see, the goal, what you really want to do is to try to get your stalls close to the delivery trucks. But having roads like this, this is really good because that would only be two. But of course the path could actually, what if the path was like this? All right? That would be six. So it's not just a matter of being close to the delivery truck. You want to get the path such that the actual distance traveling the path is short. But you're wondering, Daryl, how do we get paths on the board? Because they're not in the draw pile. How do these get added to the board? Players don't add these. These get added automatically based on some rules. Two basic rules. One is that every delivery truck and every stall must have road access on at least one side. So what that means is that if you have a building, I'm gonna call them a buildings, there's stalls and also these little tables, and no tables aren't buildings, but bear with me. I'm using plenary games terminology. If you have a building here, then that means that this space would have to become a path. Because otherwise, if you put a building here, this is blocked off and you no paths will go to it. So anytime the last space uh, is available, everything else is blocked, that last space has to be a path. And all paths and all empty spaces have to be all connected all at one time. And so if ever there is a single space on the board that if you put a building, a stall or a table, on that space, that it would split the uh, the green areas, the paths and the, these empty spaces into two, that's not allowed. And so that space would immediately have to become a road. So an example of that would be, what if somebody built a stall here? Well, now this space cannot get any wooden piece, can't get a table, can't get a stall, because otherwise it would cut off this space from all the other green space. So immediately after somebody puts this building down here, immediately this space must become a path. Now what's important about that is that you don't actually have control over those where those paths go. Instead, as players build things on the board, the paths are gonna snake around, keep everything connected. But it is important every time somebody puts down a new wooden piece that you pause the game and look and make sure no paths uh, need to be placed on the board, or if there are, to do so. This is very important and it's a very easy thing to miss. It's one of the challenges of this game, but do your best, it's really important. So as I mentioned, these markers are for reserving spaces on the board. You're putting a marker down in a space with the hopes that later on, you'll be able to put a stall there. But if, for example, somebody puts a building here, and then later on somebody puts a building here, this needs street access. So as soon as somebody puts a building here, immediately this is going to get a path to connect to that. Now this is still looking good for Blue. Blue can put a stall here if a stall comes up in time. But if somebody later on puts a building here, well guess what? This still has to stay connected to everything else, so there has to be a path here. And this player, even though they reserve that plot of land, too bad. Eminent domain, expropriation, whatever you want to call it, this player's marker gets kicked out, player gets it back, and the path goes in there. And that is a key thing to understand in this game. That's where the whole game is. You want the paths to get close to your markers and then get the stalls at the right time to get them close to the delivery trucks. And you also ideally want to get the paths going through other players' reserved plots, because that way it kicks them out. <laughs> so that's the key of the game. 
Okay, so what happens on your turn? Well, the first thing that happens at the beginning of the game is that everybody takes turn putting down one of their reserve markers on any empty space on the board. You can pick any space for this first piece, okay? And then everybody does that. I'll just, I'll just put some out here, okay? Now, starting with the next turn, this is when the game proper starts. On your turn, you can either place a reserve marker on another empty space on the board, or draw a tile. If you don't have any markers left, then you have to draw a tile if they're all on the board. If you have no markers on the board, then you have to place one, you can't place a tile. You have to have markers on the board before you draw a tile. Starting with that second turn, all the reserve markers that you put down have to be touching, that is next to, either a path or another player's reserve marker. So if there is, if there was a path, and then somebody put this path, uh, somebody put built that there, and then there's a path that ends up going here, now it's okay to put something next to that path. That's fine. You can place next to paths, and you can place next to other players' markers. But you, you can no longer put something just anywhere on the board. That's only for that very first marker. So that's reserving a tile. Just put a marker down on a space that's valid. Or you can draw a tile. Generally speaking, you want to have a lot of markers on the board first before you start drawing tiles because you want to be able to have a good place to put whatever tile comes out. If it's a stall of any of the types or if it's a table, it's, it, you're gonna hopefully put it on one of your, of your spaces. So you wanna make sure if it's a table, you know where it's gonna go. If it's a cheese stall, you have a good place to put a cheese stall. So generally speaking, you'll put most, if not all of your markers on the board before you start drawing. I would say at least five, maybe all six. Now, assuming you have some markers on the board, I'll throw a couple more in here, say. So assuming you have a bunch of markers on the board already, then you can look at drawing a tile. So when you draw a tile, one of two things are gonna happen. It's either going to be a stall, in this case it's a cheese stall, or it's going to be a table. The table is the simpler one. If on your turn, I'm, let's say I'm blue and I draw a tile and it's a table, I immediately have to place it on one of the plots of land that I've reserved. Anyone, doesn't matter, matters I'll choose which one I don't want to choose this one which is very close to there I'll just put it there and then a table goes on there's a little visual reminder of that because otherwise it'd be pretty bland I'll just put a little table on it and the, the player gets their reserve marker back and this is a building in the sense that uh, it will block the path so the path will have to go around but also keep in mind these don't necessarily need road access just these and these need road access. The tables don't, but the tables will block the path and force the path to go around them. And again, that's a key, where these tables go. They don't give you any direct benefit, but very good placement of these tables will allow you to direct the path in the direction you want to go. And so if that's a tile you draw, you just place it on one of your reserved spaces, and that's all you do on your turn. Now, if it's a stall, Instead, an auction starts. Now, I would recommend having an extra marker to indicate who the current player is, who, whose turn it is, because the auction's open to everybody, and I just find it's easy to forget whose turn it is. If you're not playing with the full complement of five players, maybe use one of the uh, other colors that aren't in play and just pass that around as a, as a turn marker. Because no matter whose turn it is, when the, if a stall comes up, Everybody's involved because now an auction happens. Players are going to take some of their money, okay, they have some money, and they're going to decide how much. They'll, they'll keep the rest of it in their other hand, and they'll take some, and they can choose zero, and they put their fist out like that, holding some amount of money that other players don't know. And everybody does this. Everybody who doesn't yet have this stall, if blue already has a stall, like so, on the board, then blue doesn't participate. This is just everybody else. Anybody who doesn't have 
a cheese stall would participate. And each player is gonna put out a certain amount of money, zero is okay, and then everyone reveals. And the player who bid the most, that's the only person who's going to have to pay anything, everybody else gets their money back. They pay their money to the bank, that's out of the game forever. You never earn money in this game, you just spend it. And then that player gets that tile. And just like the table, they get to put it on any of their spaces that they've reserved. In this case, if it was blue, blue would probably do something like this. That's, that's pretty good, that's pretty good. So now this way, no matter whether the path goes here or here, he's going to be adjacent to that road and it's only gonna be one, so that's really good. But of course, you don't want to necessarily spend too much money to do it because any money you have left over subtracts from your total score in a good way. So that's the kind of the, the balance of the game. Now, if it was Blue's turn and Blue won the tile, then Blue's turn is over. But if it was somebody else's turn, and let's say Blue won it, then that player, it's still their turn. And they get to choose something else to do. They could draw another tile, or if they want, they can change their mind and put another reserve marker on the board somewhere. Now the game is going to continue like this. Now if, if this was built, I should point out that here's, this is what I'm talking about, okay? This space has to be a path. Because if somebody builds something here, this empty space would be cut off from the rest of it. So this space has to be a path. So like I said, it's tricky, right? Because every, after, every time you put something on the board, just double check to make sure you don't need to add paths. It's very important to get that right. So the game's gonna continue like this until uh, this pile runs out. And when this pile runs out, then we get to give out these tiles. So there's gonna be players who, one player who doesn't have a soda, uh, one player who doesn't have cheese, could be the same player, could be different players. And anyway, they're going to go in this order, the order is important, the order that you establish at the start of the game. And the player who doesn't have a soda now gets this one and gets to put it for free any place they have a reserved marker. And then the player who doesn't have a cheese stall does the same and so on, and then do all four. And then it's a matter of totaling up your score, adding up the distance of all four of your stalls to their delivery trucks and subtracting any money you have left over. So a little bit later in the game, it's Blue's turn and Blue draws a table and Blue decides to put it here. So let's see what happens. This marker comes off Blue gets it back, and we put a table here. Now, what you can see is this area is in danger of being separated from everything else. So what happens? A lot of paths are placed on the board, starting with this one. Remember, any space that if you put a building there would cut things off has to be a path. I need a bunch of paths for this one. And all this becomes a path. And this becomes a path, red gets kicked out. How about now? One more, blue gets kicked out. Maybe that was a bad move for blue, I don't know. But blue get, gets kicked out because again, if a building was placed here, this would all be cut off. So, blue loses his marker, he gets it back, but it's off the board. And that's the result of putting this table here. So you can kind of see uh, the big dynamic changes that can happen in this game uh, based on just the placement of one building and suddenly a couple of markers had to uh, come off the board. Okay, here's the end of a sample three-player game. There's still these stalls to give out, but the draw pile is empty. So now we're in the final stage of the game. And when we're looking at this, Remember I said at the beginning, the order is important. So this tile is gonna be given out before this tile, and this tile will be given out last. Whoever doesn't have a soda stall will get this for free. The order is very important, you'll see. So blue gets this, now where is blue gonna put it? Here's the soda, so let's say blue puts it here. And now we check again, do we have to add any paths? And the answer is yes because this area is about to be cut off from the rest of it. The path didn't go this way, the path has to come this way. So yellow is gonna get his marker kicked out. And now who doesn't have a cheese stall? 
So that would be red. Red chooses this one. And again, we have to put some paths on. In particular, we add one right here, because if we put a building here, this area is gonna get cut off because these buildings are here. So this space has to become a path. Now, who doesn't have an ice cream stall? That would be blue. So blue, let's say, puts his here. And that means that this has to be a path. And finally, the fish stall. The only player doesn't have a fish stall is red, so red will get it for free. And technically a path would go here. Oh sure, I'll put it down, why not? But the game is over at this point. So now we total up the scores. And the scores, again, are the distance from each stall to its delivery truck. So if we look at blue, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. There is a maximum. Check the rule book. I think for a three player game, it's ten. If the path is longer than ten, just say it's ten um, uh, for any individual stall. For red, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. <laughs> 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10. So red's also 10. And yellow. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. So yellow did the best. However, we still have to subtract from those scores any money left over. Maybe yellow spent a lot of money to get these prime spots. So at the end, you take your score, and then you subtract from that any money you have left over and the player with the lowest score wins. That's it. You're ready to play Fresh Fish. I don't really think of Board Gems as a, necessarily a review series. I mean, I obviously review the game. I teach you how to play and I go over why I like it and why you might like it too, why I consider it a gem. But I'm not necessarily always highlighting the pros and the cons of the game. Sometimes I will, and I will do that with this game because its cons, at least from some people's point of view, are really important to know, because this game definitely, definitely is not for everyone, okay? I would actually venture a guess, this is my own opinion, that if you sat four random board gamers at the table and taught them this game and let them play it, then afterwards asked them their opinion, you would probably have two people who thought it was okay, you'd have one person who quite liked it, and you'd have one person who really hated it, because often the scores are relatively close, um, sort of, because you might have some one person who won, got a really low score, and you got two people who had reasonable scores as well. Then you had one person who has a massive score, which is bad, remember, in this game. You, don't, you want a low score, not a high score, but they have a very high score. And as a result, it really sours them on the experience. Um, I do have the opinion, though, that in some ways, games should be divisive. There are games that everyone can like, but to me, it's important that a game is not perfect, but is a game that some people will like, and maybe some people don't, because there's way too many games in the world, okay? You can easily find a game, sure, that can satisfy everybody, and everybody can play it, and they think it's fine. My opinion is that a game shouldn't even be on the market unless there's something special about it that would, at least to one person out there, they would play this game and go, oh my God, this is what's been missing from my life. There's no other game like it. It's amazing. It's perfect for me. It's my favorite game. And in order to achieve that, to be someone's favorite game, it should do something that other games don't. And that quality, whatever it is, is maybe something that other people don't like. So the divisiveness of having a game that a lot of people like, or some people like and some people really don't, is not a downside to me. It just shows that the game is special. I do think this game is special. I think it's fascinating. This is a game, I'm not even joking, I would watch other people play this game and I would still have a great time, right? Because it's just so fascinating to watch 
the the paths and how they how they uh, it grows and twists and turns the players have some control but not direct control right and it's such a fascinating experience to see that unfold and obviously when you're playing the game to strategize to figure out how to get the path going toward your reservation markers but not necessarily through your reservation markers and it's just a fascinating experience to me but it's a game i've always liked more than other people i've played it with i don't recommend this game in a family setting um, not that it's complicated it's not complicated to learn but it is a little intimidating and or difficult to strategize to see how how that how you can manipulate the path to go the way you want it to that's a challenging aspect and i would say the first game you have to treat it as a learning game you know and tell people up front you know it if you play this game you may like it but that first game you might do horribly but bear with us promise me promise me guys that you'll play a second game with me and that this game is just to see how it, how it works and then hopefully after that first game people even the people who got a really high bad score can go okay i did really badly but now i can kind of see how it works i think i'll do better next time so fresh fish is unique like i haven't seen another game that does that and so that's why this game has kind of a special place in my heart it's i'm i have a soft spot toward it but i have to kind of limit my enthusiasm for it because it really isn't for everyone now, I want to talk about the different editions because I cut my teeth on the Plenary Games edition. And look, everybody who plays this game for the first time, even the first couple times, makes mistakes. As long as they forget the rules, the problem is that when you're playing the game, ideally, every time you put a tile down, you, everybody's looking at the board and going, okay, so a new tile came down. Do we have to do anything? Do we have to add new paths? And at least for the first couple games, it's very easy to make mistakes. There's lots of photos on Board Game Geek, including one or two of my own, maybe, um, of photos of the plenary edition of games played and comments pointing out, it's like, well, that's wrong, that that should be a road or that shouldn't be a road. I'm like, okay. By the end, because I haven't played this edition in a number of years, by the end, I was very good at identifying where the paths go. And one reason is because even though the artwork is very simplistic and is definitely a hard sell today it is clear i'm going to actually show you uh, some of the plenary edition tiles here now i don't know how well this is going to come up maybe i'll come a little closer here so you can see they're kind of solid colors almost but the th and they're kind of you know i guess you could say they're poor but one thing i want you to see is that the color goes all the way to the edge okay including the road tile, you see that. So if these tiles are all together, you can kind of see the grid is very obvious. Now that's important when trying to visualize it, not only in terms of your of strategizing, trying to figure out where the path is going to go, but also just making sure you don't make any mistakes. The new edition, the Fresh Fish edition, like I like the plenary edition and I just wished there was a better edition. I will say this is it. Okay, this, the, the new edition or new wrist edition um, from 2F Games is the production is really great. There's no complaints at all. This is definitely the definitive version. And if you're looking to get this game, it is the one to get. However, the two times I played it, I made mistakes in... And it's, it's the type of mistake where you look at it and go, people, somebody's making the turns like, oh, guys, hold on, guys, I just realized, actually, this should have been a road, and that should have been a road like four or five turns ago. And invariably, there's someone who goes, oh, well, if that had been the case, I would have done my move differently. And then as a result, you soured the experience for one person, right? So it's really important not to make mistakes in the game, um, to make sure that the paths do what they're supposed to at the right times but that's hard in this edition because of these tiles so i'll show you the three different types of tiles here we have this is where the the market stall would go and this is where a table would go in the old edition it would be like a park or an apartment building or something and this is the path 
And it's a study in green and brown. All the tiles are green and brown, and the colors aren't really differentiated on the edges. This one a little bit because of the path, but everything else is green on the edges. And what happens is, is when all these tiles are laid out on the board, and I encourage you to rewind and look at the uh, game as I was teaching it so you can see what I'm talking about. From an aesthetic point of view, it's good that the grid blends away, so it has a more natural look to it. But I have a really hard time visualizing where the path goes, and I kept making mistakes. So here's the thing. This is definitely the edition to get. If you want the, if you want the game, get that edition. For me, it's not perfect, and I'm not expecting every game to be perfect. But after playing the Planary Edition a few times and knowing its limitations, in my head I kind of had it pictured like what a, if I were to like make a copy of Fresh Fish just for myself to play, what would it look like? I think they did some really great decisions with the new edition, especially the variable board. They had the different boards you put together to make whatever shape you want. I think that's really great. But, and the, the wooden pieces are quite colorful, um, so they really stand out. I like that. I'm losing my voice here. But because of those tiles, the green and brown tiles, I actually don't enjoy playing this new edition. The old edition is terrible to look at, but at least I can play it kind of properly. And this new edition, I have a very hard time with it. That might be a personal thing. Maybe you would have an okay time. I would recommend you go back, look at the how to play video, uh, and just use your own judgment as to whether you think that graphic um, design is going to bother you. And you need to make, if you're thinking of buying this game, you need to make a decision. You need to judge your game group. Like I said, I don't recommend this for a family setting. It's a bit too cutthroat. Um, it's too easy for one person to have a bad experience. I would recommend this for a group of like-minded gamers, the same group of people ideally that meet every game session and are willing to sit down and play a game a few times before moving on. Um, this game definitely rewards multiple plays. Um, that first game, for some people new to the game, will be a learning experience. If you're interested in getting the game, that new edition, this edition here, this is the edition to get. Now, I'm looking on Board Game Geek. I was reading some forums before, before posting this video, before doing this video. And my impression is this edition is starting to get a little out of print. At least people are having a hard time finding it. Usually what I say for these sorts of games is, you know what, if a game is good, don't worry about it. It'll get reprinted later um, if the game is good enough. Don't spend $100 or whatever on an old game, right? <clears throat> New games are often quite good as well. Um, but wait for reprints. I don't have any confidence that this game will be reprinted. Uh, even if it is sold out, and I'm not sure that it is, but if it is sold out, I don't know how fast it's sold. That's usually like a key indicator whether something will be reprinted. And like I said, it's the addition to get. But for me, the perfect edition would be something a little bit different. And I'm never going to get that perfect edition. Um, but anyway, if you're interested in the game, get this one. And I would suggest don't wait too long because I don't think it's going to be reprinted anytime soon, possibly never. That's my thoughts on Fresh Fish. It's, it's a unique game. It's special. There's no other game quite like it. And that's why it's a board gem. And like I said, it's always a pleasure for me, but it's really not for everyone. So hopefully I gave you enough information to help you decide uh, whether the game is right for you. Uh, thanks for watching. And remember, old good games don't stop being good uh, just because new games come out. Take care.